morning and welcome to church. We are so glad that you could be here with us today. Uh, we're going to start our service singing together. So please stand and let's join together and sing.
going to continue singing a declaration of what we believe. Um, we sing a lot when we're, you know, in the car or at home doing the dishes, maybe in the shower. Um, but this is a time for we to come to, for us to come together and sing together and declare together as God's people what we believe. Father God in heaven, we thank you that we can believe and that our belief is secure in you no matter 
the good days, the bad days, the fun times, the hard times, we know that your love saves us. And we can trust in that and believe in you. Amen. Please grab a seat. Say hi to those around you. Make everyone feel welcome. Welcome. Welcome online. It's great to be here at church again. Morning, Ben. The room feels empty because the youth are already gone. Don't you reckon? Like all the teenagers fill up this little middle section. If if you notice there's gaps in the middle and the youth aren't here, you're allowed to sit there. So it's okay. It's not a special secured zone for them. Uh, but they're not here because it is gate crash tonight. So that's why the youth are not here. It's going to be gate crash. That's where uh, occasionally, I think once a term, we run evening church a little bit differently and say we want the youth to get used to sitting in, in actual normal church. So we invite them along to the evening service for gate crash. So that's along tonight. If you have teens uh, and high schoolers that you want to get introduced to church, gate crash is a great way to do that. So that will be tonight at 5 p.m. Um, jumping around a little bit here. Uh, if you are new or visiting, you know, what is this guy do do doing? What is this church? What is happening? Uh, please fill out our contact form, our Connect card. You might have received one on the way in, or you can hit up the URL and do it online, especially if you are online. Uh, it's a great way to let us know that you're visiting, and we just want to reach out and connect and let you know about the work we're doing here to spread the love of Jesus to the northwest of Sydney. Uh, we're not going to spam you, but we'd like to say welcome and just let you know what it is that we are trying to achieve here and do as part of the mission that God has given us uh, to go uh, and tell all nations. Uh, if you uh, if you've been here a little bit, you've done the Connect card, we've said hello, uh, and you've signed up and you're going to our New to Life event, that is today. Don't forget, if you've signed up for New to Life, that is happening today. If you've missed out on signing up for this one, after the service, reach out to uh, connect with Miles or Melissa. Miles was the guy you saw here on the piano, if you don't know who Miles was. Uh, Miles, <laughs> say hi to him afterwards around how you can sign up for the next New Life event where we give you a bit more detail on what we're doing uh, and sort of give you an introduction into how you can start getting more involved in the church here. Uh, the last announcement we have is next week, there is no 5 p.m. or 8 a.m. service. So 10 a.m., you guys are going to be fine here. Just come to church like normal. Uh, but next week, we have our Celebration of Salvation uh, service, and we've got the, we're having baptisms, and we've got the bishop coming out, uh, I've heard this great line, when the bishop comes, you've got to be really polite and welcoming to him because he can only move in diagonals. <laughs> Wasn't my joke. Uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't name the guilty party of who gave me that joke. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, B Bishop Gary Koo, it's a bit of a coup for the church. We've got Koo coming, um, coming here. <laughs> I thought after the diagonal one, maybe that one would land. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, we're gonna, the bishop coming next week, uh, we're going to be celebrating people joining the family of God uh, and signifying that through getting baptized uh, or um, confirmed, the other one we do. Uh, so if you are keen to be here for that and celebrate people giving their life to Jesus and, and affirming that publicly through those, that is happening next Sunday here. Uh, it means we're po possibly going to have guests here. So again, make sure you're always a welcoming bunch, uh, but look out for new faces next week as well at the Celebration Sunday. Uh, now, one of the things we, we do as Christians to help things like keep the lights on is we, we give not just of our time, but of our resources. Uh, money is how the world goes around, and it's no different as a church. We do need uh, money, and, and as treasurer, putting my, my wardens and treasurer's hat on, uh, I wanna say thank you on behalf of the wardens uh, that for all the generous gifts that God has put on your hearts to help support the work we're doing here. Uh, and if you're keen to know more about how you can support the work here financially, uh, this video has some details. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name is Beth. I'm going to pray for us. So if you want to join me in prayer, that would be great. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the ministry here in Riverston and our wider parish, and we're excited about what you have planned for the future of this church. Thank you for each person here. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit so that our church might grow. And we pray for each person who shares in the life and work of this parish and for those in paid ministry and for those who give their time to teach kids and youth, provide morning tea to foster community, welcome newcomers, provide hospitality through coffee, read God's word clearly to us, set up chairs, work with technology to make the service heard and seen in the lounge rooms of those who can't attend, and every person here who, whose lives are more valuable than gold and more precious than rubies. Please lift the spirits of those who are tired or sick or troubled. Help us to see each other and care for each other. We pray especially for Mark's leave in ICU. Please give him healing and peace. And please pray for Wendy as she cares for him. Please bring people around them to care and uphold them. Bring a sense of your love and peace to them and help them to see your care for them in this time of difficulty. We also pray for new to life today, that many will come and they will feel welcomed and connected into this church family. Now, God, we look to our wider world and we thank you for the Olympic Games that are coming to an end and we thank you for the gifts given to each of us and for the joy of watching sport over the last couple of weeks. We pray, Lord, that the Olympics have opened people's eyes to the issues of religious freedoms around the world for competitors from countries where the gospel is suppressed. We pray that they have heard some good news of Jesus. We thank you that the Olympics have been safe. We thank you for the relationship building that has happened at grassroots levels and through international relations that many world leaders have met together in the spirit of um, cordiality to enjoy the games. We pray, Lord, where the church is hidden in the nations that are represented, that God would keep pr protecting Christians and keep the flame of faith alive. We pray that, Lord, despite our world's political agreements, that peace would come to many nations. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have been caught in the crossfire in both I Israel and Gaza. Lord, preserve life and shelter for those who own and proclaim your name in those lands. And above all, we pray that the peoples of Israel and Palestine will find everlasting hope in you. And in the land of your sons, redeeming death and resurrection, please turn hearts to look to the Savior and live. Bring peace, Lord, while we wait for Christ's coming and rule when all people will beat their swords into plowed shares, when nations will not take up sword against nation, and when every tear will be wiped away by the Prince of Peace and Lord of Lords. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Divya. I'm going to read the Bible today. If you're new here today, you might have been given a Bible on your way in. It's yours to keep if you don't already own a Bible and bring along with you when you come and visit us next time. Today's reading is from Hebrew, chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 19. If you are new to reading Bible, please go to the table of contents. Uh, you will find Hebrew towards the end of the New Testament. Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, Think carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he was faithful to God who appointed him just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. That is why the Holy Spirit says, Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did <coughs> when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them, and I said, their hearts always turn away from me, 
They refused to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of, your will will, none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it who rebelled against God even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Great, thanks, Divya. Good morning, everyone. It is good to be here. It's good that you are here. Uh, this is the best place to be on a Sunday at 10 a.m. I'm glad that you're able to be here with us today. It's preaching time. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you, are, you know us all better than we know ourselves, which means that for each of us in our lives right now, you know what is bringing us joy and what we are fearing. You know what we have plenty of and what we need. You know what we are seeing clearly and what we're ignorant of. And so, Father, as we look at your word, would you please speak to us and would you please help us? Would you turn our fear into joy and turn our need into plenty? Would you turn our ignorance into clarity? And we pray this so that we might follow Jesus more closely and love him more deeply. Amen. Well, how do you relax? How do you wind down? How do you slow down? My parents are brilliant, as in they're brilliant parents, but they're brilliant, they're clever. And the main way I know this is because they are very good at cryptic crosswords. Now, if you haven't come across cryptic crosswords before, they look like a normal crossword, just there, ready for you to put some letters in, but every clue is a riddle. You have to untangle the words or the meaning of the words or, or some of the letters or all the letters or do some anagrams or do whatever it is. And every author, every compiler of a cryptic crossword is different. And they have their own quirks and they have their own rules and they just kind of do whatever they want and you need to figure it out. Cryptic crosswords are very hard. And my parents are so good at them, annoyingly good at them. Morgan and I will be sitting there looking at a clue for 20 minutes and then we'll text them and then they'll just reply straight away with the answer. The last one we did, it was this really hard clue. I called my mum, she was like, the answer's cheesemongers. <laughs> how, how did you not know? When I was 10 years old, what they would do to relax is they'd get a cup of tea and they'd get a cryptic crossword and they'd sit down and they'd do it together. In fact, when I was 10 years old, my dad wrote the cryptic crosswords for the local paper. But a few weeks ago, when I was hanging out with them, we got a cup of tea, and we sat down with a cryptic crossword, and we did it together. And that's how they relax. That's how they unwind. And even though I am nowhere near as good as them, I've grown to really enjoy the challenge of cryptic crosswords. And they are one of the things that I like to do to unwind, to slow down, and to relax. If you like them as well, we should hang out and do them together. But how do you relax? How do you unwind? How do you slow down? You know, you've had a massive day at school and there's been a big exam, a big assignment, it was handed in, or you've had a massive day at work, you've had a day of meetings and the long-term deadlines finally ticked off, or you've had a massive day at home, packed with errands and giving lifts and life admin and all the things, or any of those things, but it hasn't been a day. Oh, no, no, it's been a week of those things, or it's been a month of those things, and you've finally got some time to just relax and slow down and unwind, what do you do? Go outside for walks, 
pet the dog, listen to a podcast, you stay inside, you play video games, watch TV, read, nap, clean. Some people do that. Maybe you like to go somewhere. You want to go to the, the park, the beach, the cafe, go to a soccer field, kick a ball, go to the gym, go to that one bakery that does the best almond croissants. Maybe you like to complete something or, or work on something. You know, you're working on an old car, you're showing the veggie garden some love, you're crocheting, you're knitting, you're drawing, or you're doing a cryptic crossword. How do you relax? How do you unwind? Because, you know, relaxing is really healthy and really good for us. When God made the world and everything, he made the world and then he rested. And then he commanded his people to work and to rest. Relaxing is good. However, in Hebrews 3, one of the things that we discover is that when it comes to following Jesus, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, relaxing isn't good. Slowing down isn't wise. Unwinding isn't the plan. Following Jesus isn't like a picnic in the park. Following Jesus isn't a stroll listening to a podcast. Following Jesus isn't a cup of tea and a cryptic crossword. You got your Bibles there? Let me, let me show you. We're going to see together what following Jesus is like from Hebrews chapter 3. Have a look at what the author tells us to do in chapter 3, verse 1. Think carefully about Jesus. Consider Jesus. Which sounds like the kind of thing you might say to someone who doesn't yet follow Jesus, doesn't it? Someone's thinking about coming along to Alpha. They have questions about life, faith, meaning, all the things, or you're asking someone to read the Bible with you one-to-one, or, or someone's just struggling and asking you for advice or help, you should think carefully about Jesus. It's good advice. Jesus promises life to the full, and so you should say that. But this letter isn't written to people who aren't yet followers of Jesus. It's there, clearly, at the start of verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters who belong to God. It's written to followers of Jesus. If you follow Jesus, then you should think carefully about him. We, today, should think carefully about Jesus, which is what we're doing right now. One of the ways we do that is what we're doing right now. And our kids are doing it right now, and our youth are doing it right now, and this is what our life groups do, what our church does. Our church is helping and equipping people to look carefully at Jesus on our own, with others, different places, different contexts. This is what we're doing right now. And in a moment, we'll see that in particular, the author wants us to think carefully about how Jesus is greater than Moses. This is what we're talking about in this series on Hebrews. But before we get there, it's important for us to hear the tone of chapter 3, verse 1. We've got to read the room, feel the vibe. Why should we think carefully about Jesus? Because this verse isn't an encouragement. This isn't, hey everyone, let's all keep thinking about Jesus more carefully together. That's true, we should, but that's not the tone of this verse. That's not the vibe. This verse is a warning. This is, hey everyone, you really need to think about Jesus carefully. Because if you don't, maybe things might not go so well for you. It's a warning. You know, every Sunday, our church should be and, and is, I think, I hope, a place where we can come together as sinners and find joy and encouragement and refreshment and peace. And that's still going to happen today, even as we hear God's warning. Because the right response, the correct response to God warning us isn't guilt, isn't fear, isn't insecurity, isn't have I done enough. Jesus took our guilt. Our guilt was nailed to the cross. It's done. We can confidently declare and hope that our guilt is dealt with. Jesus has done enough. The right response to God warning us isn't guilt. It's humility and thankfulness. Listening to God, hearing what he has to say humbly, and thanking him that he's forgiven us. And if we respond in humility and thankfulness, that will lead to an even deeper joy, an even stronger encouragement, an even sweeter refreshment. 
an even more profound peace. This isn't like a teacher at school warning us. You all had that teacher at school. You know, if you do this one more time, you're done. If you get this wrong, if you speak out of line one more time, you're on detention, whatever it is. That's not what this is. This is God warning us. This is God saying, I love you. I've already forgiven you. I want you to experience life to the full. And so be careful. Watch out. And so chapter 3, verse 1, you and I need to think carefully about Jesus. Because if we don't, things might not work out. Let me just show you why I think that's true, why this is a warning, and then we'll talk about Moses. The first hint that this verse is a warning is because of where we end up later in chapter 3. Verse 6, verse 12, you can scan down and see them there. They are clear warnings that flow out of chapter 3, verse 1. But the second, and I think far more important hint, is that chapter 3, verse 1 is developing, is expanding chapter 2, verse 1. And so just flick back a page in your Bible, swipe left on your Bible app, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what it says. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. We must listen very carefully to Jesus, or, warning, we may drift away from him. Last year, Morgan and I went to... Cairns went up North Queensland and we got to go snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef. It was awesome. Really good day. We saw sharks, we saw turtles, and because Morgan was pregnant, when she snorkeled, she was a submarine. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Actually true. When the boat arrives at the reef, what, what happens? The first thing that happens is they attach the boat to the mooring, to the anchor. That's how it works. Because otherwise, it wouldn't stay in the same place. The currents would, would push the boat away. It would drift. And that's the picture here. Listening carefully to Jesus is like connecting the boat to the mooring so that we can stay close to him. But if we don't listen carefully to Jesus, then watch out. Because maybe we'll just slowly drift away from him. The currents of life will just... Will just push us away from him. We'll just nudge us away from him. And, and maybe we won't even notice that it's happening. Chapter 2, verse 1, listen carefully to Jesus so you don't drift away. Then chapter 2 continues, and at the end of chapter 2, it says, you're going to be tempted to drift away. And so what do you do when you're tempted? You look to Jesus for help. Therefore, chapter 3, verse 1, and so look carefully at Jesus. These verses are connected. The logic continues. It's one warning. Hope that's convinced you. Now let's look at what they say, the, the author says about Jesus and Moses. Let's think carefully about Jesus and Moses. Moses was great. Not perfect, but he was great. The Bible speaks very highly of Moses. I mean, have a look in verse 2. He served God faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house, with God's people. And so did Jesus. But Jesus is greater than Moses. And there's two reasons that are given here. The first one is that Moses was a part of God's house, a part of God's people. But Jesus made God's house. He made God's people. Jesus created Moses. Moses only exists because Jesus created him. This is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. It just says that Jesus created the universe. And so he is more glorious than Moses. Now, we know what glory is, don't we? Especially when the Olympics are on. We know all about glory. So many incredible moments from particularly our Australian athletes. I reckon the coolest is Ariza True, 14 years old, winning gold for skateboard, so cool. Um, I, don't know if, I don't know if you heard this bit. Uh, the deal with her mum was, if she won the gold medal, she could get a pet duck. And then that's what's happening, I think. That's, the plan is that she's going to skateboard, there'll be a duck on the skateboard. Awesome. 
But so many cool athletes, there's, you know, Titmus and Wern and O'Callaghan and Palmer and Fox and Fox, two sisters, awesome, McEwen and Morse, securing Olympic glory, being the best at their sport. Arguably, I reckon the most glorious moment from the Olympics was when Majane Lopez from Cuba won the gold in wrestling. That's his fifth gold medal in five Olympics. So he won gold, 2024, 2020, 2016, 2012, 2008. Incredible. After he finished, he took off his boots, he's retired, he's done. First gold medal at 21 years old, last one at 41. So cool, so glorious. Perhaps one of the lesser glorious moments from the Olympics was perhaps Rachel Gunn breakdancing for Australia. I am I'm happy for you to change my mind. I just didn't quite understand. She was there at the Olympics. That's awesome. I just didn't understand. But glory is weight, is awesomeness, is splendor, is grandeur, is triumph, is honor. You know this. We recognize glory. We look towards glory. We can't look away from glory. And Jesus is more glorious than Moses because he made Moses. Imagine if all of our Australian swimmers from the Olympics, all the gold medalists, they're all together in the change room. They've decided to have a race to see who's the best. And, and Jesus is there too. It's not fair. Uh, you know, he might run on the water or turn the pool into wine or something. But imagine the swimmers are talking and one of them's like, you know, I'm the, I'm the greatest at freestyle. I'm the greatest at butterfly. I'm the greatest at long distance. And they all look over at Jesus. And they're like, what about you? And Jesus says, I'm the greatest because I made you. You have strong arms and legs. I made your arms and legs. The Olympics exists because of me. I created the element of gold. I created Australia. I created water. And that's right. That's true. The builder of the house is more glorious. Jesus is more glorious than Moses because he made Moses. That's the first reason. Second reason, just briefly, Moses is a servant in God's house, but Jesus is the son, is the heir, is the inheritor, is the owner of the house. Moses, the servant, he, he you know, gets paid, gets food, gets shelter, because Jesus, the son, provides for him and for all the other servants in the house. The master is greater than the servant. Jesus is greater because he owns the house that Moses is a servant in. That's the second reason. But then the author of Hebrews flips what we're looking at. He turns our attention away from Moses, and now we're looking at ourselves. Have a look at verse 6. We are God's house. If you, follow here, if you follow Jesus, then his death and his resurrection counts for you, and you've been forgiven, and you are God's house. We are God's house. And if you're here and you haven't yet started following Jesus, then his death and resurrection can count for you, and you can be forgiven, and you can become a part of God's house if you turn to him and start following him. We are God's house. Jesus is the creator, we are the creation. Jesus is the master, we are the servants. We are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. That feels like a very heavy if, doesn't it? We are God's house if, condition, we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. If we don't drift away, if we hold on to Jesus, if we think carefully about Jesus. This is a warning. Watch out. Now, there's lots of deep theological ground that we could cover here, lots of fancy words. We could talk about Calvinism and unconditional election and perseverance of the saints and Lots of people think lots of different things about all those different words. And if that's the kind of thing that you like to spend time in and talk about, then we can talk afterwards. Here's what I want us to hear from this verse. I, I tried very hard to craft this and to be clear about this. 
I didn't want to be careless when talking about this kind of idea. Let me, let me speak as clearly as I can. Verse 6 doesn't say, we will be God's house if we keep our courage. It doesn't say, we will in the future become God's house if we remain confident. It doesn't say, you'd better keep your courage and you better remain confident if you want to become God's house one day. That's not what it says. It says, we are God's house if we keep our courage. We are currently, right now, God's house, God's people with Jesus if we remain confident. I think this verse is just saying what the rest of the Bible is saying. A genuine follower of Jesus is securely, eternally part of God's house right now. So how do you know who is a genuine follower of Jesus? The answer is, they're the ones who, with the help of the Holy Spirit, will keep their courage, who will remain confident. Like we said earlier, this isn't a warning from a teacher. You know, if you mess up one more time, if you do one more sin, if you, if you drift around that corner and I can't see you anymore, you're out of the house. That's not what this is. This is God warning us, I love you I've already forgiven you. You are secure in my house. There's a place for you at the table. I want you to experience life to the full. And so, be careful. Watch out. Be warned. We are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident. If you follow Jesus, you are right now God's house. And with the power of the Spirit, you will keep your courage. You will remain confident. In John chapter 6, Jesus is talking about the people that God has entrusted to him. And he says he's not going to let any of them go. And you can trust him. We are God's house and God is warning us to keep our courage, to remain confident, to think carefully about Jesus and watch that you don't drift away. It's my best attempt at being careful and clear and we can talk more after. We are, right now, God's house. You know, sometimes one of the hardest parts about writing a sermon is, is drawing out some implications. You know, we work through the text, we see what's going on, we're hearing God speak to us. And what are we gonna, what are we gonna, how are we gonna respond? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna think differently? How are we gonna change? What's gonna happen? Not, not today, today's easy. The author just says it in the rest of the chapter with real clarity. We know exactly what to do out of this warning. God warns us, and here's how we can protect ourselves. Watch your heart and watch each other's heart. That's what we're going to do. That's the plan. Watch your hearts and watch each other's hearts. In verses 7 to 11, we're reminded of the story where God rescues his people out of Egypt. And out they go, and they go through the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army chases them, and they're crushed. And then just time after time, they just let God down. Oh, I'm so thirsty. We had water back in Egypt. Let's go home. I'm so hungry. We had, we had food in Egypt. Let's go home. I wish I were dead back in Egypt. That's what they say in Numbers chapter 14. And so then they are in the desert wandering for 40 years. They didn't watch their own hearts. They didn't watch each other's hearts. Their hearts became hard. They didn't just forget what God had done. They totally rebelled against him. And this is what it looks like to drift away from God, to lose courage, to lose confidence in God. I wish I were back in Egypt. And so verse 12 warns us to watch our hearts. When the Bible talks about heart, it doesn't mean the, the organ pumping blood, it means the core of our being, the primary motivator, the source of our emotions, our desires, our, our thoughts, our morals, and our hearts are very good at all the wrong things. We're very good at it. Our hearts are very good at justifying sin. Is it really that bad? Our hearts are very good at letting ourselves be deceived by sin. Our hearts are very good at just drifting away from God, letting the currents push us away from Him. Our hearts are very good at, 
at losing courage, losing confidence. Our hearts forget quickly. Our hearts are very good at elevating ourselves above Jesus. Our hearts are very sneaky, and we need to watch them. You know how in Disney movies, they sometimes teach kids to follow your heart? That is the worst advice you could give anyone. That's terrible. Don't follow your heart. Watch your heart, because our hearts are very good at doing the opposite of what God says to do. And this is why we need each other. God's so brilliant, and his brilliant solution to individual followers of Jesus who are struggling with their hearts, like you and like me, is for us to hang out with each other and for us to encourage one another and to warn each other, like it says, and to be in community together, to to do church together, to be the church together, to celebrate the wins of faith together and and to wade through the failures together and to build each other up and to push each other forward and to drag each other along. That's what we do with each other. And not just sometimes, but, but today, daily. We need each other daily because following Jesus is difficult and it's constant and it's challenging and it's draining and it's monumentally worth it, of course, but it's so hard. When I was studying engineering back in my early 20s, uh, a, a pretty significant part of my life unexpectedly blew up and just kind of fully fell apart. And I was following Jesus, and, and my heart did not respond well. Classic heart. And no one really knew, I didn't really tell anyone about it, but a friend of mine at uni, he, he loved me enough to push past the barrier and to ask me about how following Jesus was going. And this friend dragged me back to Jesus. I hadn't let go of Jesus, but boy, I drifted a long way away. And my heart was full of deception and self-pity and bitterness, and it was hardening and spiraling downwards. And, And I wasn't watching it at all, but my friend was, and he dragged me back to Jesus. And that's right. That's that's the picture of Hebrews chapter 3. And most of the time, watching each other's hearts won't be as dramatic as that. Most of the time, it will be as simple as turning up here at church and, and helping fill this room and singing out with your voice and being an encouragement to the people around you and pointing our hearts to Jesus. Most of the time, it will be as simple and as amazing as that. But this is what we do. We watch our hearts and we watch each other's hearts. We know that God loves us and because he loves us, he has warned us. And so watch your hearts and watch each other's hearts. At the start, I told you about cryptic crosswords and how following Jesus is not relaxing. It's not slowing down. It's not unwinding. I hope you can see that now. It's constant, it's hard, it's draining, it's turning up when you don't feel like it, it's listening carefully to God when it doesn't suit you, it's checking if you've drifted, and if you have, it's rowing back to Jesus as fast as you can, it's checking your heart and watching your heart try and fight Jesus for first place, and it's checking other people's hearts, and it's seeing the same thing, and it's helping them. It's not relaxing. It's not coasting. Let me say this in enough ways to lock it into your heart, whoever you are. Following Jesus is a hike, not a picnic. It's a race, not a stroll. It's, it's rowing, it's not fishing. In Mario Kart, it's the 200cc rainbow road race, not the 50cc Mario circuit. It's growing a mango tree, not a tomato bush. It's playing ocean on guitar, not smoke on the water. It's crocheting a tapestry, not a granny square. It's beating dark souls, not animal crossing. You get the picture? It's hard. It's working for Gordon Ramsay in his kitchen, not 
cooking two-minute noodles at home, come up with your own. Make it memorable. It's hard. It's draining. It needs endurance. And whichever one of those resonated with you, it's not even just that. It's doing it together. It's watching our hearts and watching other people's hearts. If you stop, if you slow, if you coast, if you relax, if you try to do it your own, watch out, because you're going to drift. And so wherever you are right now, however far you've drifted from the moor and you're looking around and noticing that you've, you've gone a long way away, or whatever your next step is, or whatever part of your heart is being exposed right now and it's squirming in resistance, and, and whoever you need to ask for help, and whatever you need to do, or change, or, or say, or think, or start, or stop, today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are a good and a loving Father who warns us and who teaches us. And Father, we're sorry for the times that our hearts become hard when sin deceives and when we elevate ourselves above Jesus. And so help us to think carefully about Jesus. Help us to watch our hearts. Help us to watch each other's hearts. Help us to cling to the mooring so we won't drift away. And Father, we prayed at the start that you would please turn our fear into joy and please turn our need into plenty and turn our ignorance into clarity. And so, Father, please, would that continue to happen as your spirit works in us. And we pray all these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing together. Please stand and join with us.
Lord, we thank you that we can come before you and that we do so as the house of God, not alone, but together with all of your people. As we heard today, Lord, we pray that our hearts will not drift and we'll remember that as written in James, that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Amen. We are the house of God. We're doing this together. Uh, so now we have some of that together time with community. So feel free to hang around. We've got morning tea. There's hot drinks at the back there. Line up, grab a coffee uh, and spend some time encouraging one another that your hearts may not drift. And we'll see you back here next week.